Friends of the Alameda Free Library. We are joined today by Alice Wilson Free, a Bay Area author of two novels. Before we get started though, I want to review technical details about the webinar. This is a live webinar and it will be recorded and on the FAL website in a few days. You are welcome to use the chat feature to introduce yourself. We monitor the chat and the Q&A and ask that all participants act with respect in their comments. The audio for all audience members is muted and the video is turned off. So you will only see Alice, her presentation and me for part of the time. At any time, I encourage you to submit questions to the Q&A icon on your control panel. I will read your questions to Alice at the end of the presentation. So please ask questions. And please understand that we are new to hosting webinar events. We have practiced, but issues may arise. We are far from experts, but wish to create a great experience for all of our listeners. Before I introduce Alice, I want to tell you a little about the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. As president, I am joined by a board of 14 dedicated Alamedans. The Friends is a nonprofit organization that raises funds and advocates for an outstanding public library in Alameda. In this age of the pandemic, the library is adapting to new challenges by creating opportunities for community engagement online. The Friends has been working alongside the library, ensuring that our role as advocates continues through shelter in place. From producing new virtual content to keeping the community up to date and reporting on our local librarians' work, the Friends is committed to his role as a library support organization. As many of you know, the Friends has sponsored a number of face-to-face -face events in the past to raise funds. Unfortunately, we have canceled the spring and fall book sale, closed Dewey's Cafe, and delayed sending out requests for donations. Additionally, we have canceled our fabulous Live at the Library Jazz series for the fall season, although we are working to schedule virtual concerts, so stay tuned. We are rethinking our used book sale and are now selling a small number of used books on Facebook and the categories change weekly. A new set of books is added Monday through Thursday, so check out our Facebook page. So while we miss the opportunity to get together with our friends and supporters, our first priority is the safety of those who attend our events. These Friends at Home events provide an opportunity to connect with you and to share common experiences. We thank our supporters for their ongoing donations so that we can continue to honor our commitments to the library. And we do incur expenses to provide programs like these. They have been very popular, so much so that we have had to expand our Zoom license to allow more attendees to join us. A good problem to have. We ask that you consider a donation to the Friends in any amount that is comfortable for you via our website at alamedafriends.com. Now on to our program. Our speaker today is Alice Wilson Freed, a former Alamedan and familiar to many of you. A native of New Orleans, Alice attended Tulane University and later worked in public relations at the Delta Queen Steamboat Company. For the past 28 years, Alice has lived in California with her husband, Frank Freed of Chicago, who died in 2015. She has two published works, a nonfiction entitled Menopause, Sisterhood, and Tennis, and the first of her mystery trilogy called Outside Child, set in New Orleans before Katrina. Outside Child receives a 20, 2008 Silver Award for Excellence in Independent Publishing and was named finalist in the 2008 Next Generation Indie Book Award. The sequel, One Drop, book number two, set during Hurricane Katrina, will be released on August 15th, 2020. And she is working on her book number three, 
focusing on the aftermath of the devastating storm. Other writings include a screenplay entitled The Hot Flash Caper, which placed first in the 2008 East of Eden Writers' Conference content. So please join me in welcoming Alice back to Alameda and to friends at home. Alice? Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, thanks to the Friends of Alameda Free Library for this opportunity to uh, connect with readers. Um, after the death of my husband, it made sense for me to move from Alameda to live closer to my immediate family that's here in this area. So I relocated to Solana County. But Alameda will always be the place where I lived when my first mystery novel, Outside Child, was published. Uh, where I interacted with so many great writers, particularly with the um, To Live and Write in Alameda group. Uh, and it will always be the place where uh, I forged lifelong friendships, particularly the women and men that I work with, with, uh, with the League of Women Voters. And those friendships will prevail despite the distance between us. So I'm really, really happy, happy to be here. Tonight, what I want to do is to take you on a trip into New Orleans and uh, show you how that city sort of um, developed the reasons why I wanted to write. My award-winning novel, I Saw a Child is the first of a trilogy, trilogy uh, in the set in pre-Katrina New Orleans, just as Karen said. And it follows the career and life journey of LaDonis Washington, a smart, sassy, ambitious Black woman who often finds herself in a, crim in a hotbed of criminal activity in corporate America. And her brother, Heart Trouble, he's the con artist, remains in the housing development where they grew up, but he has to help her get out of the jams that she finds herself in. I'll give you a little brief summary of that reading from here. When Tim Gannon ends up in the blaze of a New Orleans paddle boat, a grieving LaDonis finds opportunity. Tim was her mentor a white man willing to advise and guide a young, ambitious, well-educated black woman who grew up in the Magnolia housing project. Now his death, the manner of his death and his secrets opens a door to promotion and success. But LaDonis is in over her head from the start. Floating Palace Steamboat Company CEO, CEO Greg Collins and marketing vice president Lamar Caston force her into their personal worlds of rivalry and deceit. Her initial forays place her in increasing jeopardy. Only her brother Heart Trouble seems able to rescue and deliver her from the villains and the dangers they threaten. Heart Trouble comes to her aid with intelligence, street experience, even attitude. In any, cir any other circumstances, LaDonis would have rejected her younger brother's street smarts. Will he renew LaDonis' understanding in the value she has scorned and abandoned and in turn discover value in her ambitions? Not before sister and brother face death together. Okay, now I hope that gets you started and gets you going because that's, what, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a mystery so that you can see the relationships that go on between siblings and people of different places and things. It's really a fun, fun book to read. The second book in this trilogy, One Drop, finds these characters in another murderous situation while trying to escape Katrina. And it's expected, like Karen said, to be released on August the 15th. A lot of people want to know from me, why do I write and particularly why do, what inspired me to write a mystery? And I have to say that um, books saved my life. That's all, that's, it's just as simple as that. One year when my mother couldn't afford to, um, when my mother couldn't afford to send me the dollar that it cost to go on a field trip to see an operetta, I believe it was Carmen, and it was at LSU, uh, the Louisiana State University, couldn't afford to the dollar to go. So we, I had to go to the library, and Ms. Prout was a librarian, and she gave me Pygmalion to read. And I read Pygmalion all night that night. Went back to the library and became a fixture. And Miss Proud instilled in me that books could take me outside of the world that I was growing up in and help me to realize that 
there was a there, there were other places and people that I could see and become engaged with, and it really opened my eyes to a whole to a whole world outside of the Magnolia Housing Project. And besides that, there were lots of stories and poems about New Orleans that I read, but I noticed that most of them were were about the past. There were not many contemporary stories about my city, and that's what I wanted to write about the the, the then and the now. And I wanted my readers to get a glimpse not only of what the role history plays in the now, but particularly what role history plays in the lives of Black people. And the other thing is that Southerners are storytellers, and my family was no different. For every fact of life, for there's some saying that my grandmother and my mother could come up with, they come up with an entire fable, some act of the past that would come to mind no matter what we did right or what we did wrong. It's just in my DNA to tell a story. It's just what we do. And writing was, is, not, is, is a li lot more than just telling a story, but that's who I am. So in my books, both fiction and nonfiction, I use that aspect of my Southern life to give my characters not just identity, but purpose. In my nonfiction book, Menopause, Sisterhood, and Tennis, for instance, I use my grandmother's understanding of menopause as a catalyst of my own journey through that life's process. And in my fiction, I use that same grandmother's sayings and teachings as my main character's conscience. For example, I'll give you a quick example. And I believe this is one, this is something that I wrote in a part of um, um, One Drop. Ladonis took one giant step forward, skipped in front of two women and a man, then headed for the exit. She had to rethink the situation, consider another way to find out what the police had on Bunny. But when she got to the exit door, Detective Travis stepped in front of her, leaving. His fake grin covered half of his unshaven face. Can I help you? No, LaDonna said, knees wobbly. Her grandmother Lucille had told her to look the enemy straight in the eyes no matter how scared you were. Take some off guard and make some respect you, she said. LaDonna's locked eyes with the detective, bold as Eve in Eden, while bolting her feet to the floor. This is what I'm talking about taking those stories and those ideals and putting them into a character is part of my legacy to how I re respect the re legacy of my mother and my grandmother. And it's, it's throughout my writings. Another reason why I, that, why I was inspired to write is um, very few contemporary stories are written about New Orleans that actually written by native people of New Orleans especially stories that are written by Black natives of the city. And there are very few contemporary stories written by Black natives of the city. Most of the stories that we write are steeped in history. And, and while I don't want to disregard that, because I can't, I, I'm a firm believer that you can't figure out where you're going until you know where you've been, but it's important for me to, re, to remember history in my writings, that spoken word history and wisdom that was recorded in the minds of my mother and my grandmother and transmitted to me through their tales as well as their advice and their teachings. So I want my storytelling to reflect those lessons of pride and integrity that entertain me as well as taught me about life and particularly the need for self-identity, to self-identify. And I want that, those stories to reach as many people as possible. So I write. But to tell a contemporary story with history as a backdrop to show present day consequence without preaching, teaching, and whining, this is my big thing, no preaching, no teaching, no whining. This is my challenge as a female writer of color. What I had to do to make this more relevant is to make the, cha the characters relatable and the story evocative. So I'm going to read something to show you just what I'm going to, you know, how I get there. I'm going to do what Rachel does. I'm going to read and then we'll address it on the other side. Um, LaDonis Washington heard the front door chimes the second she stepped out of the shower. This is from the first chapter, actually. She stood there frozen in the moment, naked except for chill bumps. She could still see see him standing in her bedroom door, Jack that is, 
looking at her as if he couldn't decide whether to jump her bones or beat the crap out of her. Open up, it's me, a male voice said. Shit. She recognized the nasal tone. Her brother heart trouble. Mama must have told him about the bookshelves. She grabbed the sweats lying on a folding chair and pulled them, pulled them on, then headed for the door, glancing around at the unpacked boxes. She'd been in her new condo only one day and one night. Smells of paint, sawdust, and plastic still fill the air. I may not have a man, she sighed, but I sure as hell have a nice place to be lonely in. Heart trouble knocked again. She looked around for her sneakers, slipped them on, and opened the door. Heart trouble swung his lanky frame around to face her. Purple lips and pug nose, his cocoa complexion just a shade darker than hers. She hated that they looked so much alike. People she didn't care to know always knew who she was. She was Heart Trouble's older sister, Lord help her. You don't have to knock the damn door down, she said. What kept you, Heart Trouble said, standing in her doorway in a loud orange print shirt and brown rayon polyester slacks. The Donis frown. No time to get in an argument with her no account sibling. She had a broken heart to nurse. Besides, if he knew why she was dragging, he would make her feel as though she let the last black man on earth get away. What are you doing up so early, she said to her brother. I thought street hustlers kept vampire hours. What else, you woman? First you tell me mama want to see me. Then you go looking for me in the magnolia like you the fucking police or somebody. Now you act like I'm dog shit on your shoe. Okay, so here, Readers with siblings or some family member that is annoying can relate, a relatable character. Most of us have someone with whom we are always arguing or fighting, with whom our jealousy can rear its head. This is a relatable aspect of life regardless of who you are. And that's what I had to do. I had to make these characters relatable to anybody who's reading this book. The passage is also evocative. Uh, you get a glimpse into how the siblings get on. You get to see LaDonna's sassy attitude into what she thinks about her brother and how her brother feels about her. And so how do these emotions affect the reader? Some hate LaDonna's and love heart trouble. Some are impressed with her ambition and some despise her for it. But as a writer who was rejected once for not writing evocatively, I'm elated by that. I'm so happy that that happened because whether you like LaDonis or hate trouble, heart trouble, you've connected with these characters emotionally. Therefore, I have actually create, created relatable characters whose interaction instigates an evocative story. Now, another inspiration for me writing is my family. My family is a melting pot. Jews, Muslims, Christians, atheists, black, white, Filipino, gay, straight, you name it, it's in my family. And we get together often and we spend a great deal of that time telling stories about each other and about those who are gone now. Remembering, reflecting, and passing on. That's what we do. That's what we spend our time doing. It's just, just a wonderful thing. So I want it through my writing, I wanted my mama's and my grandma fun's voices to enlighten and entertain my family as it is now. And I wanted to entertain my family generations from now. And that's why I write. And through my writings, I want their voices as well as my voices. I want those voices to be heard, not just by my family, which is why I want it to be published. I want it to be heard throughout the world if possible for other generations as well. And when I realized that I had a knack for telling and entertaining story, telling entertaining stories, I started imagining bestsellers and movie deals. But it wasn't until I actually started writing uh, and the stories just began to flow out of me that I realized that it's about more than that. I'm inspired to write because I like the fact that my stories enlighten people. I like the fact that uh, I encourage people to interact with each other, especially those who are different. Because you learn so much about yourself when you open yourself up to other people, and I learned that from experience. When you learn about other cultures and, and, and other places. That may be corny, but that's just the way I roll these days, I'm sorry. <laughs> and my kids tell me that all the time, you're so corny, Granny. 
But anyway, I find that writing mysteries is a way to get the heavy stuff off cross without doing what I just can't do, preach, teach, and whine, but what I have to do actually as a writer. And so this brings me to the section of tonight's talk, which is really just about um, um, outside child. Get a sip of water. Well, like I said, outside child is a mystery. Uh, it's the first of a trilogy set, trilogy set in New Orleans. The protagonists are reluctant sleuths, Ladonis, an MBA, her brother, a con artist. But Ladonis is the one who finds herself in the middle of murder and mayhem, and she needs her brother's streetwise, all of his streetwise activities and connections to help her get out. So why did you choose the mystery genre? Well, part of it is because you have to find a way to make these stories interesting without the whining part. But what really made me turn to the mystery genre was on an airport, I was in an airport on one of my junctions between New Orleans and California once, and I passed a bookstore and I saw a book titled Black Betty. And I was drawn to that book because in the project where I grew up, one of my neighbors and a very good friend, she was called Black Betty. And I'm thinking, another Black Betty? And it's a mystery written by Walter Mosley. And Walter Mosley, as you know, writes, writes about Los Angeles. I read that book on the plane and I decided that this is the, way, this is the route I was going to go. I learned both from reading Mosley, I read Black Betty and then went back and read all, a lot of his other books. I learned from him and by participating in writing workshops and taking classes in the UC system, that if I wanted to get published, but more importantly, if I wanted to be read, I had to tell my contemporary story without preaching, teaching, or whining. And by the same token, I wanted to show, new, show readers my New Orleans, not the touristy New Orleans, but the city where I grew up. I wanted to show readers uh, how the city was governed how the city governed its people, especially Black people. I wanted to show readers how culture in New Orleans impacted my life, my day to day. In other words, what I really wanted to do was preach, teach, and learn. You have no idea how hard it is to tell a Black story, fiction or not, without preaching, teaching, or whining. It is very, very difficult. I'll give you an example. I'm going to go to page 29 and read a little something. Okay, like they do on the news shows, I'm going to read this and we'll talk about it on the other side. All right, this is, this is what I'm calling a teachable moment. Ladonis pulled up in front of 20 BB Industry Street. Tall grass and weeds surrounded Monique's house, making it look out of place amongst the one-story bungalow-style homes with their manicured St. Augustine grass lawns and blooming flower beds. Before the 60s, practically no dark-skinned families lived in the homes built and inhabited by the black French carpenters and bricklayers, craftsmen just white enough to get the jobs that paid enough to construct these modest dwellings. Ladonis lingered inside her car, staring forward. Why was she here? Was a false sense of purpose corrupting her integrity, the way Monique's unkept yard undermined the character of the Seventh Ward neighborhood? This is a teachable moment instead of a whining moment. It could have been easily been a whining moment. For example, if I written, Ladonis pulled up in front of 20 BB Industry Street on a part of town where dark-skinned Blacks couldn't afford to live because only light-skinned Creoles were trained to be carpenters and bricklayers that could afford to buy a home here. Instead, by comparing a corrupt integrity with an unkept yard, the reader gets a sense of that sentiment, but without being hit over the head with it, without the anger and the aggravation, but with introspection. And this is another, this is one of those things that as a, a writer of color, trying to get your story out, trying to get your preaching, teaching, and whining out, you have to how to do 
but they're but they're actually learning about the about the character and the places the place in which you're writing. On page two twenty seven, I'm going to read you something that I think is a preaching moment. Okay, two twenty seven. Okay, and this is from uh, chapter 30, and it's called Black Man's Collateral. I love naming my chapters, too. Uh, it's part of that, I don't know, it's sort of, it, it was, it's one of those things that uh, as I'm writing, I get through it about 50 or 30 times, 30 or 50 times, and finally, one thing sort of stands out in my mind, and then I get this this is what the chapter is about. And then all of a sudden, the whole chapter makes sense. And then I can sort of roll it back into the, the fabric of the entire story. So in my writing, you're gonna see all of the, all of the chapters have, uh, have titles, and I love that. The Snuggling Inn was a bar located across the street from Flint Goodrich Hospital. Once a revered Black-owned and operated medical institution, now all boarded up. The place reminded Ladonis of how a community, a way of life, had evolved during the short period after civil rights when the government's conscience was a black man's collateral. Then all that disintegrated. Black-owned stores and restaurants gone, shut down to make way for freeways, discount big box retail stores, and drug pushers. Ladonis screeched into the no parking spot in front of the bar. She jumped from her car and rushed inside. Bobby Blueland's 1950s hit, St. James Infirmary, blasted from the jukebox. A little honky-tonk action was going on the dance floor. A middle-aged couple bumping and grinding as if they were in bed. Four other men and two women, all over 40, probably under 60, sat at various tables, but no hot trouble, and none of his pals. The sn snuggling in wasn't the seedy hole in the wall LaDonna's had pictured either. The banner across the bar explained why. Owned by a Zulu social and pleasure club member. Translation, the owner belonged to a club for New Orleans black middle class whose original working class members had organized as a benevolent society. The first black insurance company, if you will, where the dues were used to help out when sickness and death occurred. Ladonis walked over to the bar the smell of red beans and hot sausage got stronger as the sound of smacking lips got louder. Several men sat there digging, through, digging their way through the piled high plates in front of them. Single men, motherless men, had to be. Every black man living with a living mother in New Orleans went home to his mother on Mondays for red beans and rice. This is a preaching moment with emphasis on atmosphere. White readers get to walk into a bar, hear music, see dancing, get the feel for the culture in this black part of town without fear, but in a slice of life moment. Everybody has these moments. Then they get to see that blacks do indeed have a history of taking care of each other without feeling guilty that they never knew or understood that about blacks before. And Black readers get the chance to be proud that others who read this, this book at least, will have this to think about when they hear that Blacks are lazy and always looking for a handout. Teachable moment, relatable, relatable to, the, to the reader, relatable characters. This is what mystery writing meant to me. This is why I chose this genre. And this is, this is how I chose to present not just my story, but my city. And also, like most Black writers, I strive to change stereotypes to show that we Blacks have the same problems, the same hopes and ambitions, the same character flaws, and are just as capable and culpable as any human. And that, even, that we even have the same vulnerabilities. Now, I know here in California, you're wondering what I'm talking about. Uh, because um, like so many of my friends, it was, it's kind of hard sometimes to, to relate to all of the things that, that we go to. My Jewish husband used to always, always say to me, a smuck is a smuck, dear. Doesn't matter about anything. But, but that's really, really my point. 
Many of us don't know what it's like to live comfortably in someone else's skin and to thrive, especially in black skin and how to thrive. So just being aware sometimes can have a powerful impact on, on, on your own development. And frankly, I can't imagine what my life would be like without my non-black family and friends. Yet if I had not ventured outside the black bubble of the Magnolia Heisen Project built to isolate me, the only world at my disposal would not include other people and other cultures. It would just be one group of people all the time. If I had not read books about other places and other people, I would have remained a victim of stereotypes and ignorance. And I would not be the member of the most beautiful, diverse, diverse family imaginable. And added to that is learning that individuals are different. Even those who come up in the same circumstances that you do. I wanted to shed some light on the fact that even when facing the same situations, when you have the influence of the same environment and you go to the same school and uh, you're, you're, you have the same economic background, all of this determines how each of us makes it through life. But you also have to realize that one size does not fit all. I'll give you a good example of that on page 123 really good example. But Donis dared not to tell her brother what was going on with her. Not only would he give her a hard time, but at this level of high state corporate shenanigans, the fewer people in on the details, the better. The owner of the company, LaDonna said, has invited a few lawmakers on board to live at the gaming bill, and he wants me to be there. She wanted to sound excited, but how could she express excitement about Tim passing? or her plans to get on board to find out why he died. The gaming bill, Hot Trouble said, Donnie, don't you know what gambling will do to this city? It's people, which happen to be mostly poor black people. Hmm. Provide a few jobs, I think. But Donnie's pulled herself a glass of wine and downed it. Of course, that would mean that you and your buddies would have one less excuse for sleeping all day and loitering all night. What you talking about, Donnie, Hot Trouble said. People will spend their rent money, grocery money, insurance money. They'll gamble it all away. Hot Trouble sat on the stool at the kitchen counter. Girl, why you let them use you to tear down your own kind like that? Bringing your people down is what you do, Adonis said, pouring herself another glass of wine. Your way of thinking is so limited. Hot Trouble's victimized philosophical air was more than Adonis could take. How could two people who had grown up learning the same principles and ideals from the same source have such different contexts of thought? Limited, huh? Hard Trouble said. Why you say that? Because I don't believe that unless black folks are moving in white circles, dreaming white dreams, or in plainer English kissing white ass, they aren't worth a shit. Oh my God, if you'd open your mind, LaDonna said, you realize that's exactly what you think. And you see that dreams and success are not spelled W-H-I-T-E. Same grandmother, same mother, same lessons on life, but different perspectives. That's just human nature and that's just the way it is. And I wanted to show that in my writing so that anybody reading can see how my life, how my situations, while different, we still have the same stuff going on. As difficult it is to tell an engaging real story about a sassy, ambitious black woman while acknowledging the other realities of her life without preaching, teaching, and whining, I believe Outside Child does that. Um, listen to this review, Kevin Arkaday, a uh, writer producer on the television series, series The Shield said about Outside, Outside Child. He wrote, Outside Child is a Creole stew of crime, politics, and Southern manners that gives me a flavor of New Orleans before all that water washed away some of the spice. The sibling relationship that's central to the story evokes Walter Mosley's easy Rawlings and the colorful relationships that make that world so exciting. Every time I read that, I get a little goosebumps. I mean, to be compared to Walsall Mosley, whoa. But to me, this proves my point. 
So does Kara Black's review. She wrote, Outside Child rivets to the page, keeps you turning pages, and brings back a vanished New Orleans. That's the history part I was talking about. Based on these and other professional reviews, Outside Child and the craft of mystery writing enable me to accomplish the goal of presenting a contemporary story set in a historic city about a Black woman without teaching, preaching, or whining. Now I'm gonna read a uh, part of a chapter here, uh, chapter 24, page 167, to see if I can get you to be even more interested in reading about LaDonis' and Hard Trouble's journey in, uh, in, in New Orleans before Katrina hit. Um, and also to get to see uh, some of her sleuthing so that you can really get into some of the story. But Dennis made her way from crew quarters to her cabin with even more questions, more theories, more doubt. Nice as he was, Trina had said, Tim wasn't who everybody thought he was. What in God's name has she been talking about? Had Tim been a dope dealer or a drug addict? Had he been a people smuggler or a whistleblower? Maybe the answers were in the bag after all. She read the typewritten letter first. First from Tim to Brett, from Tim to Brett. Tim had written about a plan to relocate, but he hadn't said anything about drugs or Decatur or the Mexican woman. The letter simply read as a goodbye note. Next, she picked up a ticket envelope from United Airlines, one way to Tahiti. Tim was going to Tahiti. A business card fell from the folded itinerary page. Ladonis replaced it inside the ticket envelope without reading it. Had Tim suspected that an SEC investigation would expose him? She could see the media, media coverage the floating pallet steamboat company, owners and operators of the only two paddle wheelers traveling America's rivers, transport illegal immigrants and killer drugs to the heartland. Heaven forbid. The other envelope contained escrow papers on a house in East New Orleans deeded to Brett and to Tim. Apartments in New Orleans East were fast becoming the new projects for the poor. Why would Brett or Tim want to live in the East? or even on property there. The land on which the St. Thomas housing project had been built was a different story. It was prime real estate, a port expressway close to the convention center, to upcoming gentrified downtown neighborhood shops and restaurants. That land had been leased to the city and the 99 year lease was coming to an end. The owners wanted it back and why not? People with money and jobs in, in the city wanted to get into that loop. Urban pioneers was how realtors labeled these mostly white yuppies. Urban invaders was more like it though. However, to move a new population into the city proper, the project's poor had to be cast out, and they were, to New Orleans East. More below sea level than any other area than met. If a level three hurricane or a Betsy-like storm were to come through, the entire area could end up underwater. Ladinas checked the envelope with the escrow papers again to make sure she'd emptied it. Two photos of the same image tipped out. She recognized the ex-governor, also the mayor's right-hand man, Louis Delaire, right away. The third man wasn't so recognizable and the camera had picked up only a hand on the fourth man. She turned her attention to the cassette tape. That tape might explain why Tim had these photos. What if the tape was all the police needed to close this case out? She couldn't just hand it over to them. They want to know how she'd gotten hold of the damn thing. Should she give it to Brett? Sure, eventually. First though, she'd have to listen to the cassette. She gathered up all the papers placed the photographs and the tape in another envelope and put that envelope in her purse. There was a cassette player in the conference room. She listened to it there. 
this tape could very well be her ace in the hole, but she'd have to wait until she was assured again to do it. The Magnolia Bell rolled under the Mississippi River Bridge near the Pelican Street Wharf. Madonna felt the boat stop and rock on the low waves. She heard the purr of the dying engine and listened to the muffled voices of the workers as they went about their chores. She got up, dressed in a pair of tan slacks and a pink tunic blouse, in a hurry to get outside. Maybe she'd see the Mexican woman. Madonna's made her way to the gangway as the moon crested and the sky lightened. The air was warm and damp. The decks were empty. So she watched the deckhands tie the boat to the pier. Nate Blenner stood at the boat's bow. He threw a heavy rope to a deckhand standing on the dock. The same thing happened at the same time at the other end of the boat. The deckhands tied the ropes around the fat poles. Ladinus felt a little jar as the boat touched the dock. A man from the pier tossed up two stacks of newspapers, the USA Today and the Times-Picayune. Nate Blenner pried a copy from one of the bundles. A wide-eyed look of astonishment exploded on his face. What was he reading? Ladinus rushed over and pulled another copy loose from the stack. Murder on the Mississippi, the headline read. Sweet Jesus, she said. The mutilated body of Tim Gannon, vice president of finance for the Floating Palace Steamboat Company was found in the Mississippi River two days ago. Initially, authorities believed Mr. Gannon's death might be an accident, but police officials issued a statement last night stating there had been foul play. They also reported that they haven't uncovered any evidence that can provide a motive or direct them to a suspect at this time. Foul play, Madonna whispered. Images of Beryl Decatur throwing her overboard and of the contents of that bag she found appeared before her. She lifted her eyes away, aware of someone else's presence. Bunny Sinclair watched her through the window of the observatory. God, she said. She met Nate Blenner's shocked gaze with her own. Somebody killed Tim. Nate Blenner shook his head from side to side, corked eyebrows and colorless skin painted disbelief on his face. Sin against God, he groaned. Praise the Lord. Ladonis picked up two more copies of the Times-Picayune and ran for the elevator. She dropped one at Kasdan's door and knocked loud enough to wake him and Barbara, his wife. Then on to Brett's room. She pounded on his door. No answer. She tried the knob, but the door wouldn't open. Bunny Sinclair materialized in front of Ladinus like somebody on Star Trek. Funny, Bunny said, you don't look like Nancy Drew. What? Ladinus's brain was too busy to entertain any thought of insulting Bunny. She had to return that bag where she found it. Nothing was important enough for her to get caught in the middle of murder. She brushed past Bunny as if the woman were a spider web. I hope you want to read more. Outside Child, a novel of murder and mystery in New Orleans. Um, I can't thank you enough for indulging me tonight, and I hope you're eager to know more about Ladinus and Heart Trouble's journey. Please note that the second book, One Drop, uh, is on sale August the 15th. However, you can pre-order the Kindle version on Amazon right now. And if you go to my website, you can sign up to uh, receive a book, and that's alicewilsonfree.com. So now I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Karen. Alice, thank you for an amazing insight into your novels and into New Orleans and uh, the, the process of writing. It's, um, how long does it take you to write a book? Well, the first one, it took, um, it was a relatively short period of time. It took about, um, it took me about a year, maybe a year and a half. You know, once, the, once I decided that it, I was, it was going to be a mystery, I had been writing it before and couldn't seem to get what I get my story across the way I wanted to. But once I decided that it was a mystery, I started taking classes and going to seminars and it just poured out of me at that point. 
Uh, the second one, it took a little bit longer because after the first one was, um, was done and I was headed to success with that one, my husband took um, ill and I sort of became a caregiver and writing wasn't at the top of the list. It wasn't a priority and I couldn't quite concentrate the way I did. I couldn't put myself into it with the force and enthusiasm that I had with the first one. So that took a few, that took a few years actually. And, and, and on top of that, the publisher of the first book went under and so I had to find a new publisher. So it, it took even longer. So there's a big gap. So that's one, one of the reasons why I really appreciate being here tonight. So it's like I'm sort of reinventing myself as a writer and putting myself out there again. Well, we've really enjoyed your uh, talk. Um, I've got some more questions for you. Um, okay. uh, somebody said, ask if you've seen the movie uh, Mosley's David in a uh, Devil in a Blue Dress. Oh, yeah. I read the book, saw the movie, everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and David said it had uh, Don Cheadle, I think. Uh, Don Cheadle was excellent as a mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I had a couple more questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about the change in New Orleans between now and um, uh, when you grew up? Have, are there um, enormous changes in the city? Well, even after moving here to California, the change was mostly in me. Uh, I have to admit, you know, uh, my perspective and how I saw how I saw things and what I learned about myself as a result of removing myself from from one environment one environment and putting myself into another environment that I, I definitely saw, saw the, the difference, um, not necessarily changes, but I, I, I saw the difference. Uh, after Katrina, uh, though, there has been a significant change in New Orleans. And I go back from time to time because I definitely, I have to do research, uh, particularly with the, the way the, uh, the geography and how things are, it's a little bit different considering so many areas were flooded you know, as dams, as uh, dams and reservoirs broke down there. But um, the change was in me, actually, and how I see things. Uh, New Orleans is now, it's not my home, but what I read about it, it seems to be much more dangerous than it was when I was there, uh, when I grew up there. Uh, New Orleans is sort of a laid back kind of, kind of town. Um, it's small, which is why Alameda was, was a, such a good place for me because it's like a small town. I got that same feeling of living in a small town that I did in New Orleans. And that's despite the fact that New Orleans is this, this uh, very uh, cosmopolitan city with all of the, with the influence of France and Spain and England and all of these places that have, we have all of these, uh, Africa, we have all of this influence there. It is still a very small town, particularly where uh, blacks live and, and how we live. It was a very small town, which made me a real uh, small town person, which is why I enjoyed living in, in Alameda so much. So how New Orleans has changed can only be described, I changed. So the way I see it has changed. And, um, but it is still home for me. Um, even though my family, after Katrina, my immediate family, my brother, my sister who passed away shortly after my husband, my sister is gone, but my brother is now in Atlanta. His children, for the most part, are in Atlanta. My nephew, I have a nephew that lives here. But New Orleans is still home. It's where I live the majority of my, of my life. I lived until I was 45 in New Orleans. So um, it's... it's it's me that's changed. Can you talk about the names of the lead characters? They're very interesting. Are they based upon um, names when you grew up or did you make up the names? You know, it's funny you should ask that. I got a rejection letter from uh, a publisher. I'm trying to think, was it, I can't remember who it was, but this publisher said to me, uh, I'm not from New Orleans, but people I know from New Orleans say names like that just don't exist. And you know, when you get a rejection letter, you're not supposed to comment. You're not supposed to, re it's just something you pepper your wall with so that you can, you know, say screw you when you finally get that contract. But I had to respond for the simple reason, heart trouble is my brother, my younger brother who's dead, who had heart trouble, that was his nickname all his life. Jockstrap. I mean, this is what we did down in New Orleans. I mean, 
for, I, I, I write about it in the story, how Jockstrap got his name. Uh, all of those names come from actual people. Those are names. We nickname. I had a cousin, two cousins in New Orleans. One was Big Boy and one was Little Boy. They were twins. Big Boy was born first and Little Boy was born second. I had a cousin called Nine Toe. You know why? Because he had nine toes. This is the way life was. Nicknames was all part of it. But it's funny how people sometimes think you're making that up. But as a New Orleans native and a person from New Orleans, I made up not one name. Every name and every nickname was from somebody that I know. Tiny man, the, all, everything was all from, it may not be the tiny man that I knew, but the name is certainly a name that I picked up, yeah. Um, another question, um, somebody uh, asked, when you finish this series, will you consider a series based in Alameda? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> right now, at this point, I really just want to get LaDonis' arc and La New Orleans' arc done and finished. But I do contemplate a story about Alameda. And I can tell you what that story is going to be. It's going to be about my family. And um, I already have a title, Spell Fried, Pronounced Freed. And it's going to be all about the dinners and the activities and the fun that we have in, in Alameda. Um, uh, Follow-up question to that. Um, you read one passage that had some food in it. it does food uh, appear prominently in your books? Not prominently, but you got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, there was one other person who read my books. It's, LaDonis is just so busy running around. Does she ever eat? Does she take time to eat? And that's the funny thing. Uh, it's not, I, I think I will put more of it in the third book than, than anything else because food is so prominent in my life. I mean, cooking and eating is our thing. Um, I think I mentioned it in this book, um, or is it the second book? I, I don't recall. But we have something in New Orleans that we used to call suppers when I was coming up. And what a supper was is that we, we were all poor and we lived in the projects. Sometimes money for the light bill or the, something would come up and you just wouldn't have enough to pay the light bill or the water bill or even the rent sometimes. So what everybody would do would get together and the men would go fishing and the women would get together and fry up the fish and chicken and everybody put in what they had, a little macaroni and cheese here, a potato salad here, some green peas here, and you made, get a plate and you sell it for a, doc, a dollar and you get in the neighborhood and you play uh, dominoes and horseshoes or whatever else you could play and you listen to music and you dance. Food was very, very prominent. And then that's how we help other people not have to worry about having the lights turned off or the water turned off or getting kicked out of their apartment. So food is very, very prominent. And uh, I don't mention it so much in the book because that is one of the things people totally expect to be all the time about New Orleans, but I try to put it in the context of, of, um, of that culture and how it impact, say, my interest in cooking and wanting to feed everybody, because that's just the way I am. Come to my house, you gotta eat. Um, and somebody else asked, will your books be available on Bookshop by chance? I will have to ask my publisher. Uh, I know they're gonna be available on Amazon, uh, I will find out about Bookshop. I don't know. Okay. Uh, my publisher, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, you talked um, about um, when your family got together, it was a lot about stories. And a, a, a lot of that is the oral tradition. Do those ever get written down? Have you written down those stories? You know, it's my, my mother started, be, when I started writing a book before my mother passed, I have a little um, a folder right in here of some of the stories that she wrote in her own hand. Um, Let's see if I can find that to show you. My mama's stories. Here we go. Mama's stories. I have a folder with some of my mama's stories in here, one that she wrote in her hand, in her own hand, because she thought it was such a good idea to write down the stories that was going on. So... But 
we, we never forget. We always find a way to tell one of those stories. My children, oh, my daughter, can she can imitate my mom so well. And we just have so much fun doing that. Heart trouble, my brother that's dead, oh, he was a character. And the kids, when they start talking about him, those stories will never, never end. But I, I thought it was a good idea to start writing some of that down. And that's what I did. And when I started writing my book before my mama passed, she did too. She, she titled it The Good Old Days. Yeah, writing down those stories are so important. It's I'm so important. That now, you know, you have a lot of questions, but there's nobody around to ask that's, anymore. That's right. So. That's right. And that's why writing became, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write, is to make sure that those stories get told and, and that they're written down so that people can share them all around. But that's exactly right. It was mostly an oral history in my family because that's the way we did it. But I th I'm hoping that I've started a new tradition of having, having those stories written down. And will some of those stories get folded into your writing? They do. They are, they're all through there. They're all through all of my books. All the little sayings, I use, I use them as little sayings that Grandma Fun used to say, you know, mm -hmm. like, like the one that I read about um, making sure you look people who don't like you in the eye. Make sure that no matter how scared you are or how mad you are, just make sure you look them in the eye when you're talking to them because then they have to respect you no matter whether they want to or not. Um, somebody else asked, are there clubs like the Zulu Club? Are there other clubs like the Zulu Club? In New Orleans right now? Um, I... Yeah, there are any number of organizations that, you know, not quite like the Zulu Club. Can but you tell us what the Zulu Club is? The Zulu Club, if you, if you, if you, Mardi Gras is huge in New Orleans. Absolutely huge. And before the Civil Rights Bill was passed, you had Black Mardi Gras and White Mardi Gras. Now in the Black Mardi Gras, what we did was a couple of things. We represented Africa and we represented the Native Americans. So on our Mardi Gras, our floats were people dressed in African garb and they uh, threw coconuts or whatever. And this was the Zulu Social and Pleasure Club. So they did a couple of things. They entertained us at Mardi Gras and they raised money for this benevolent society that they were all about in the beginning. They also honored the relationship between slaves and Native Americans by dressing in these wonderful costumes that they, it took them year, years to, to, uh, to imitate, to, to make. And so this, was, this is how we, how we celebrated that. But that's what the Zulu, and it's still there, it's still a big part of Mardi Gras. And in 65, when the Civil Rights Bill passed, in 64 when the Civil Rights Bill passed, everybody who came to Mardi Gras wanted to see the Zulu, the Zulu, the, our parade in our part of town was what a, a lot of people from other countries like Japan and Europe, you know, Europe, they wanted to come and see the Zulu club and uh, the Zulu people march in the parades. But that benevolence, that society was set up for, for two things, what actually was set up as a sort of like an insurance company to make sure people could bury their dead and that they could take care if the father got sick and couldn't work, that the, the family wouldn't go hungry or something. That was part of what they did. But they also became a part of the Mardi Gras tradition in New Orleans. And that's still going on. Um, do any of the people you grew up with also write stories? I don't know of any of them. I don't know. Uh, uh, I know that... Um, when I was in uh, when I was in in, in New Orleans the, the last years I was there, I did a lot of um, you know me I have a big mouth and I did a lot of letters to the editor and I saw friends of mine doing things like that but I don't know of anybody that's actually written written a book but there are there are quite a few new New Orleans writers but like I said they tend to be more hist of a historical nature and I wanted. I wanted mine to be more contemporary, but not overlooking the impact of history. And when do you expect your third book to be out? Hopefully it'll be out this time in 2021. That's the plan. Well, that's all the questions that um, I see. So I want to thank Alice for a fabulous, fabulous um, 
presentation. And um, uh, we certainly lear learned a lot about writing and also about uh, New Orleans and uh, writing a m murder mystery, which uh, I had no idea was so um, involved. Um, so thank you all for attending our event and to Alice for a delightful program. Uh, just a note, we are recording this presentation and we'll make it available on the Friends website in a few days. As a reminder, we have a docent talk on August 12th, The Beat and the Hip, San Francisco Art from 1950 to 1970, and educator Bronwyn Harris will join us on September 2nd to talk about her new book. And we have a new event for those who love this presentation and New Orleans food. We're working with Alice to schedule a Cooking with Alice on September 21st, where she will demonstrate how to cook jambalaya as it's done in the Big Easy. So follow our events tab on alamedafriends.com to register for these events. And please consider a donation to Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com. That will allow us to continue to sponsor events such as these. And finally, thanks to those who helped to make this happen. David Beal and Karen Manuel for managing Zoom and registration. Thank you again to Alice and to our audience for joining us at Friends at Home.